tools or anything, just really your philosophies on it and how you make it work for your system. We have a lot of people in my programs who are just getting started with this. And we really, you know, there's so many years that are troublesome, you know, and we just want to know, like, is, is it possible? I mean, you guys have been doing it for 20, 30 years, so obviously. So I'm going to start with um, Ray McKenzie from Cass County. We got Carl Sparks and we got Bob Guzzi. And so they'll go through and just kind of give you guys a little information about their farm. No, that's fine. We're good. Um, I'm Ray McKenzie from Cass County, like Colleen said. Um, I don't really know anything. I can tell you what I do. Um, I just found out, though, being here at this meeting this morning, that everything I do, Hans just explained, and that's why I do it. And it's, <laughs> it's really interesting. Um, a comment I made to Bob in the hallway is, you can't explain it to other people that are visually impaired when they see a field that's not tilled, and that's what they're used to. Um, uh, Colleen asked us, say, why we do what we do. A lot of things are built out of necessity, or the mother of invention is necessity. Um, we did it fi for financial reasons, for a changing um, operation. Uh, we didn't have the capital and the labor uh, to get it all done the conventional way. Didn't know how to do it, and um, so we knew we'd been we'd always done it a little bit in until that maybe that was the way we could go. And uh, for us, it has financially been just a real blessing. Okay, so now. How is it now? Okay. Anyway, it's been a financial blessing because after a few years it just seems to work. When you don't know what you're doing to start out with, you need to find a mentor or someone who can kind of lead you down the road to, to assure you that it sure looks crazy that you're planting into this two foot of clover. And everybody wonders what's going on. Well, I had a mentor he's sitting right next to me. And it's really, you need somebody that kind of says, no, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay. Um, that's my five minutes, I guess. It, it works for us. It has served so many purposes. And the financial gain from it is really coming around. It's doing everything. He says we don't chop stalks. We don't... We don't use starter fertilizer. We don't even have starter fertilizer tanks on the planter. Um, there's just so many reasons it just works. You know, give it to Carl. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, Carl Sparks, Cassopolis. Ray's too kind. Ray was kind of my cheerleader because he'd come by and say, "Boy, it's looking good." And I'm like, "It does." <laughs> <laughs> but. We started back in 1977, my dad actually started, and uh, you know, I was just graduating from high school then, and uh, much of the same thing that Ray said, it was just financial. Yeah, it's hard to remember uh, gas went clear, clear up to dollar, you know, <laughs> in the 70s. And uh, you know, I, I guess, you know, Ray and Bob are probably more technical, I'm more emotional, or it's just, like when we did it, my dad said, okay, we're going to do this. And it's like, we just did it. You know, and, I, and you know, when you try to encourage somebody, I, I try to make the analogy of like, when you get into a pool of water, you know, you kind of step in, it's really cold. You don't want to do it, you know. And then there's other people in there, just jump in. Just jump in. So I guess I'm in the water, and I'm saying, just jump in. Because, <laughs> you know, even though, you know, what you think is happening, or you just got to do it. Um, we were, you know, I, got, I was trying to think back. We used to, we used to plow plant, you know, in the seventies, where uh, we'd only drag the headlands and the and the dead furrows, and you know, so we were, we would try to plow right before we plant, you know, so you wouldn't plow like two weeks ahead of time. You know, you try to plow and then plant, and. Uh, so we're kind of minimalist in that regard to start out with and then uh, you know I guess we had pretty good weed control so that helped but uh, 
just like Grace said, we didn't know what we were doing. And I really appreciate, Hans, what you've explained today, because it's like, why is the ground firmer? But it's, you know, it never made sense to me, because we've experienced the same things that, you know, a lot of guys couldn't go pick their corn because it's, they get stuck. And, yeah, you're just out there doing it. Um, and the other thing, I remember my dad, when uh, we first started doing it, he drove all around the community. Wow, you know, we had a big rainstorm. Wow, look at it. Didn't, there's no, no ponding in that field. And the neighbors got this and that. And it, and it very quickly, you know, within a year or two, you know, I mean, it's pretty, it's amazing. But that's my five minutes. Bob Guzzi, uh, 30 years ago, Wayne Hodum, county agent in Cass County, major encourager for us to take the leap. Uh, it, it is a challenge uh, when your crop's been in the ground only a couple of weeks and you have a neighbor that's been in a full tillage program and it appears to have better color, better stand, and you're getting a little nervous. You have to understand that there are a number of unseen advantages, uh, whether it's protection from runoff, conservation of moisture. When you go from the last week of July to mid-September without any moisture to speak of, and you start pulling gravity wagons in a couple months later and you have much better yields than what you anticipated. You say you just did not expect that. Well, where was that water? Hans gives that demonstration where it shows that that water is in there. Uh, other advantages that you have, uh, you're not generating some weed pressures that you might generate otherwise labor, big savings, timing advantage. If you have that spring where there's only so many days to be in in a timely fashion and you're able to get that crop in and the next day to be in the field planting is two or three weeks later, can make a huge difference also. Uh, does It is a leap of faith and sometimes you, you have to find other mentors to, to bond with to have you comfortable with looking at different weeds or something a little bit different, but there are tremendous amount of advantages. Thank you. So Colleen asked me to uh, moderate this a little bit. I have, I, have a, I have a question for you gentlemen. In what order you want to answer it or talk about it. In Indiana, we have 25% of the corn that's going to go in no-till. About 70 plus percent of beans go in no-till. So after 30 plus years of experience, I work with a lot of farmers that have almost been 40 years in no-till. How come only 25% of a farmer are actually no-till? This is the wrong room to ask it to because the fact that you came to this meeting probably means that you're either dabbling in or you're doing a lot of this already. But you guys have a, a, a feel for that. Why is that? Why is only 25% of the folks doing what you're doing? I think it's vision. Oh. I think it's a I think it's a very visual thing. Oh, it's off. Yeah. Uh, is that better? No. Okay. You can still hear yourself. I, I think it's a very visual thing that uh, it, it's just a, a, how you were brought up, what you used to do. Uh, my father, I mean, it had to be a mow board. Then we got a chisel plow, and it still wasn't quite right, but now we farm ground that couldn't be farmed before because it would either pool or pond after yeah. something went wrong or erosion. We farm totally, highly erodible land, the whole farm. And there's no, there's no washouts where there used to be, you could park buses in the washouts. Anyway, I think it's a visual thing. Um, I had a, a neighbor farmer. I actually tilled a couple headlands on a couple fields that we tore up pretty bad, thought we better till them. Planted them, and early on, the tilled corn, just like Bob said, the headland 
I mean, it was that much taller than the no-till field. And he told me, he said, you can't tell me that's not going to be done. In August, he came back by and I said, get my pickup. We drove by, we got in the back of the pickup. The headlands were that much shorter than the no-till. He said, well, it was different varieties, same variety. I had the same thing happen with there some fence rows, and we decided to till half of the small field because it was rough. And that was last year, and I pulled it into the combine and started picking, and the tilled corn, I could see it over there, it was like really tall. And I thought, oh man, I'm missing something. That is really good over there. But this seems really good. So I was shelling corn, going down and back, dumping, down and back, dumping. I got to this, I thought that's going to be great over there. I got into that, showed the rest of the field, never dumped the kind of line. It's a visual thing. Tall corn doesn't mean it yields well. I, that's my personal opinion. It's visual. I think there's, uh, I agree. Yeah, a lot of it's visual. And I, I forgot about being able to farm areas. We walked them down hills. You know, we bought a farm. They had like grass on the side hill. We planted over them. So a lot of you have to drive the tractor down the hill. You know, you can't. You know, and it's been out going up. But, you know, really, it's amazing because it just, just sort of stays there. Um, besides the visual thing, I think there's some, um, you know, with all the fodder we're getting, and corn after corn after corn, you know, that the, some of them are having problems. But the Ray's been able to. That if, if something happens, I think the fodder, after a while, the worms must eat it. it it's gone. It just leaves. It's not an issue. It just it's gone. I'll let Bob answer. Well, um, yeah, you see the earthworms eating that stuff. I have long-term no-tillers complaining they don't have enough residue in their fields. They're very happy to have cover crops now because that, that adds to the residue they have there. But if you just start in no-till, that might be tough because you don't have the earthworms up yet and you have the same amount of residue going in there and yeah, you might ball up for a couple of years. Uh, it, it's a challenge to, to see that crop. Uh, a lot of times if you if you don't have a perfectly level seed bed, it's easy to say, well, I'm not going to be able to go in with my minimum tilt planter and, and get a good seed bed. Uh, I, I had a field that was corn 2012. We did a couple of field operations after harvest, late last winter, spread some manure, and had some tracks in that field. Highly erodible field. Uh, I decided I was going to no-till it anyway. After I got done, and we no-tilled the soybeans 15 inch. After I got it, or while I was planting, noticed that there was having some depth issues, decided to go through it, got done planting the field, found a few more beans on top uh, than what I was comfortable with. Uh, next couple of weeks were tough. I thought I'd made a big blunder. Obviously, it's on a paved road where everybody's going to drive by, call all their neighbors, come show that Guzzi made a big blunder. And the neighbor puts in a field conventional three days later, and his comes up quicker and appears to have 120% stand. Uh, I, even though I may have only had 90% of the seeds in the ground, uh, by the time we got to the first week of June, had a good stand. Uh, big level of relief there, and then when we were catching those rains in June and July, things filled in and completely satisfied with what yields were there when we took the crop off in October. Uh, like I say, that was that was a field that, that I had some hesitation or wondered if I'd made a mistake and should have been in and, and done some leveling to, to have a better seed. Uh, higher percentage of the seed in there for making my bushel, but I sure can't complain on what the yield was afterwards. And as a result of having that no-till, didn't have to worry about erosion and had that benefits of the moisture conservation of what was in the ground going into August and September. 
I work with long-term no-tillers that some springs are still war wondering whether they made a mistake because their corn looks measly and across the road, man, it looks dark green, it looks really good. That is not, that's okay if you farm your own land. With the pressure of all your neighbors wanting that same acre that you're farming now, how do you deal with your landlords to actually convince them that that measly looking corn is going to make maybe more money than the stuff across the street, even though the guys are banging on his door every day, can I farm that land next year? Because I, I obviously grow better crops. How, do you, how are those relations with your landlords? How do you deal with that? I, I would say it's important to uh, help educate your neighbor on soil conservation that that time in the summer when you have a two inch rain that comes in a couple of hours and where carl said where his dad would go out and look and find find fields where there is ponding or you find fields where i guess for lack of a better term recreational tillage and there's been five or five or six trips across uh, secondary tillage and and you get that ground sealed and there's no place for that water to go and you get large volume of, of rain coming down and and you're watching that water move a long ways and and cut a slot in the ground uh, that that's something that a, a landlord needs to be aware that that you're protecting that soil from <clears throat> Ditto. <laughs> so, oh, I, you guys I, actually take your landlords out to show them some of this stuff now, Dad, or talk to them about that. I, I, I uh, think that they are, the, the landlords now today are, used, are, are either very old or, or they've died and the kids have it, and they're more sensitive to the environmental issues of today's world. And I've had so many people say, hey, if, if, if you know, my parents don't rent this out or whatever, we want you to farm it because we like what you do. They don't. They don't. They they just know they like what they see. That it's it's good. Um, in Indiana is it more crop share than cash rent. Is that where the pressure comes from, or is it just the the visual look around the the homestead? Here's, let me ask you guys. Do you go to the coffee shop a lot? It is a lot of talk about, oh, so-and-so's corn doesn't look so good. And the early no-till adopters especially told, talked to me that the toughest thing of doing this was that you lost basically your social network because you wouldn't want to go to the coffee shop anymore because all they do is make fun of you and tell you you're doing it wrong, which, which is always easy to pick on somebody. And, and then, of course, they're bragging about yields, and you guys have seen your yield tickets. You know what you're actually getting off of that. And the exception is always thought that it's less. Have you guys seen the no-till contest for the last 10 years? Who's always on top of the no-till or of the, the corn contest nationwide? It's always no-till. These soils can only get pushed so hard with chemical tillage and other stuff to get those big yields of it. Now, I know those no-till contest guys fit the heck out of it and they grow five years alfalfa and then put corn on it, all that kind of stuff. But you can only do it on no-till ground to get so high. I think that visual thing is very, very prevalent. And in farming, we know we all want it big and span, and people driving on your farm, it has to look a certain way, that's the expectation. I think we're really dealing with a lot of absentee landowners that are not even there. And in Indiana, we have a lot of management firms that do tens of thousands of acres for landlords. They manage it, basically. And some of those are very old-fashioned, and they really want a certain look, or they want it to look so that the landlord's always going to be happy my thought is you get the, and I don't want to stereotype, but you get, you get the old lady or gentleman in Florida that wants that check off their acres. If you guys can give them a bigger check, I don't see the, the thief. But you're right, is it rent or is it, is it, uh, is it, is it crop share? That, and those things have shifted dramatically over the last couple of years, and the percentages on those too. Questions? Do you, wanna, you guys ready to field some questions from the audience? Utilization, you know, that you're going to have to be chiseled off. 
So how do you kind of... You guys use manure? I, I'm a hog farmer, and Carl's a hog farmer. Um, we, we ran that same challenge. So we bought the big fancy no-till on the tank thing. Um, we're so highly erodible that we noticed that as we would unload the tank on the top of the hill and down through the valley and then go get another load and come back, all the manure was in the valley because it followed the trench. So we took on a different logic with the thing. We do not incorporate the manure. We put it all on top very lightly. My understanding of manure is whatever you put on this year, you get 60% of that value. Next year, you'll get 20% of the value of the first year, the third year, the other 20. I don't know if that's right, but it makes sense. So we put just a little bit of manure on every acre every year. People can't even tell we've done it. The odor is there for maybe a day, and then it's gone. And it also breaks the stalks down, and it just seems to make the earth work. I, I don't know. Carl? Ray, Ray's my mentor on that, too. Because uh, when we found, yeah, I know, you know, you got to be within the guidelines, but it, it is if, you, uh, if you're no-tilling. If you're no-tilling, and uh, we, exactly what he said, it's more uniform. Because, you know, we found the same thing. You don't need much of a slope, and it just runs right down. But we're still learning. <laughs> if you're looking to get started in no-till, maybe you're better off starting on those fields where you haven't been spreading manure or and stay with chisel plowing and minimal tilling at that point. Develop your comfort level with, with no-till going into those fields that you haven't put your manure down first. And then after that, see to what extent how much manure you can put on and still have comfortable with being able to get your get your seed into the soil and what what amount of uh, you know what your seed beds looking like in the spring things like that do you guys use tankers or drag lines when you get manure in your fields tankers use manure I we do not have livestock anymore. I buy commercial chicken manure and turkey manure that gets spread across the top of the ground behind our vegetable crops. We use a uh, hard hose. Oh. We, 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 we use, um, is it on? Is it on? Okay, we, we use tankers. And everybody says, oh, you're compacting that field. And he just explained why we're not. I didn't know why, but I could tell it's not compacted anymore. It is not, the mo if you think, you, and Carl taught me this, because you'd have a place that was tore up or some tracks, and you think, oh, I need to chisel that or rip that or, or do something to level that back up. That's the worst thing you can do. Just plant it a couple of years, it'll fix itself. <laughs> It'll grow. It's amazing. Anyway, we use tankers and then we use a hard hose on uh, lagoons. We have a couple lagoons. We use a hard hose traveler and use it that way. I know there was some uh, discussion about this whole manure issue because some states and some counties have ordinances now that you're, you have to work in the rain because of the odor issue. With all those city folks coming into the country because they want to live the pure country life without the country life actually being there, uh, it's getting hard for us to deal with some of those things. Herbicide issues, manure issues. Well, yeah, we have some places where you have to work it in, and we're fighting that because yes, you'll have you'll have odor for a day or two. We're actually working with a group of farmers in Indiana that put 12,000 gallons of dairy manure on per acre, and uh, they they we're trying to work with them. How can we actually sustain that? And, and, and use cover crops to, to keep the soil together while you're doing that. Maybe you have to find more acres, but can you actually make that pay? If now I have to go on double the acres, can you make that pay? And in some places, if you close to neighborhoods, the odor issue is going to be an issue, and, and we're still working on that in no-till. Uh, chicken litter is really, when the Ohioans had all their problems with the lakes and stuff, they shipped all the chicken litter to Indiana. Boy, people in Indiana are big fans of chicken litter now because it has no odor to it. So 
That is an issue. I've worked with dairy farmers that have spread it on the surface. Now with cover crops, not much of an issue with runoff anymore. Especially if you have uh, seed corn, silage corn, wheat, and you put a bunch of manure on there, put a cover crop on there. You have plenty of growing seasons for a cover crop, and it will take care of some of your uh, smell issues, and it will capture a lot of those nutrients, because you will lose a lot of nutrients if you don't. If you just leave laying on the field, a lot will volatilize, if you get some rains, it will wash off and go into your soils. So cover crops <coughs> work out there too. I have just to, to follow up on that, you mentioned just there that the, the smell, is, is that actually you're losing some nitrogen with that smell that some of it's volatizing? And, and then the other is when you put it on the cover crops, will it, will it burn the cover crop? Or is it too hot, I guess is what I'm asking. Okay, if you put manure on the cover crop, will it burn it? So you're not trying to get a commercial crop off of there. If it can't stand it and it comes through it, then not a big deal. So, other questions for these gentlemen? I really appreciate you guys sitting here. And well, as far as losing that, you probably are losing some nitrogen, but I don't know. I guess when we were dumping it in the valleys, that wasn't good either, so. Do any of you fellows manage uh, your ratio of different cations, for example, your calcium-magnesium ratio? We're, we're kind of starting to get into that with our soil testing and stuff, but I, I'm still not, not, not overly. <laughs> that's that's the answer. No, I, I, need, I need to get advice from somebody else as far as where that is and what's in balance and, and you know, what's what's premium there? It seems like it is the same question on your Protestant or Catholic. I, I, I asked my university colleagues about that, whether they need to look at it, and most university guys will tell you it's a bunch of hooey. There's nothing to it. There's several companies out there that specifically spe that, that specialize on that in their nutrient management plans to have out there. They seem to have good luck with it. So. Uh, I, I'm not so much a black and white guy anymore. The older you get, the gray or it gets, not just up here, but in your opinions too. That there, there, there's some areas where I don't know for sure. It's just. I have farmers that swear by it, and they're very strict about that, and measuring it regularly, and they, they, they think it's very important. And other farmers never even talk about it, so I don't know what to tell you there. The science is not, the university science is usually not behind it. They didn't like cover crops, they didn't like no so. um, Just because we're talking about nutrients a little bit, um, one of the things I deal with with my growers is they, they're afraid that they're going to have to add more nitrogen to their systems to break down some of that heavy residue, especially in the first few years when they're still like, building up their soil qualities. Um, is that something that you guys experienced when you first started no tilling that you had to, I don't know, add extra nutrients? to kind of break down that fodder or were you, were you just okay with your system as far as having enough residue that broke down by the time you were planting? I don't know if we did it right, but we just did it the same way. So you weren't having issues when you were planting with clogging up? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the equipment now is so much better than it was. I mean, we and we've, we've been, Probably all of us have been through about every combination you can do with your no-till planner. And we probably all run something a little different. But I, I think with the the air pressure row cleaners and the, the, the it, it's just better. It's just better. The, the row, the, the closing wheels, there's so many options out there. And, you know, if you find something that really works for you, that's, that's what you need. And, and it, the, the no-till thing is you're not going to cover as many acres in a day. You're just not. You've got to be a little more attentive to your equipment and the, and, the, and the speed. And we all probably went through that same thing. It's just, this is too hard to plant. There's too much trash. I can't do this. I don't have the money to do anything else, so I guess I'll keep trying. And, and then just, but as he explained, the the earth start the dirt starts to work and then that I think becomes a non-issue. Just jump in the pool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when we started out, we used to put our nitrogen on ahead of time uh, with anhydrous, and we 
run it at an angle because you couldn't see your rows if you, you know, get mixed up. And then, uh, so yeah, we did a lot of crazy things, but it worked. <laughs> well, Ray made a good point about not expecting or understanding that you need to maybe only allow for two thirds of the amount of acres that you might have been able to plant in another system when you go to the field with the planter. But you also have to understand you're not having that day when you're out there with the plow. You're not out there with the day with the disc. You're not out there with the finisher. You don't have those hours when you're changing points. Uh, you don't have that extra tank of fuel that, that you're having to put in the tractor when you're doing that tillage. But you do need to allow that, okay, you've planted for a couple hours. You may need to check your down pressure, check your depth if you've buried into a different soil type and check a lot more closely to see whether you're getting that seed at, at the right depth as you change from some sand into something where there's a little bit more uh, stone or gravel or things like that. So you do need to allow accordingly, but uh, I, I don't have any concerns with where, where my ending planting date's gonna be concerned to somebody in comparison to somebody that's in a tillage mode because there's also going to be times where you get those wet conditions and then you're able to get back in the field a day or two sooner than somebody else because they've got water standing and, and you have a piece of ground that's had a chance to the water's filtered through and you're able to go out there and look at it and say yep by by noon or one o'clock we're going to be good to go and be able to plant for four or five hours where that other person's still uh, changing parts in the shop. That whole application of uh, fertilizer to break down your residue is another one of those. Ooh. Illinois, of course, those guys are very, very much in favor of fall applying nitrogen still. I, I thought it was 2013, but I missed something. <laughs> but uh, they actually did a whole test where they went out a whole bunch of fields and applied fertilizer on the surface, liquid, to see whether it helped in the breakdown of the residue over the winter. And they found no significant difference in that whole, whole test they did. I would think the same thing. BT corn farmers complaining that it lasts longer. Well, when do we go out there and, and actually uh, spray some fertilizer on there? Maybe that helps, but I guess not. One thing I do find interesting, you can buy, spending, talking about spending money, you can buy all sorts of attachments for your combine head now that start chomping up your corn stalks more, that start crimping it, and some guys really swear by that, that it's really helping with the breakdown of some of these, uh, these corn varieties or the corn hybrids. You guys have any of that on your combine, either the, the, the mowers underneath the bar or the uh, crimpers as the corn comes through the combine. Do you have any of that stuff? Nothing special at this time. And while that residue can be a major challenge while you're trying to get the seed in the ground, once the seed's in the ground, then the residue is your best friend. You know, it'd be nice if you could pick it up, <laughs> plant, and then come back a few days later and spread it back out all over the ground. Because you, you have that mulch to, to help conserve the moisture and, and protect you against erosion. We don't have anything. Um, we were 50-50 corn and soybeans, and it seemed like that would help break it down. And then uh, we're, we're doing more corn now, at, but we have cattle on a lot of the acres, and they seem to break it down. Yeah, but then you have to work it after you graze it, right? Yeah. No, well, we're finding some of that. We don't like that. <laughs> We, we put uh, those stalk stoppers on the combine this year, and uh, so they push the corn stalks. They over. just they just make them lean. And so your tires don't get punctured. That's the main reason we put them on there, so they don't poke a hole in the tires. I mean, if you're running, no, uh, and then we're putting GPS on so that we do a little save some seed and other things on the planter, and um, that 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 stalk thing is is an issue that and it's just like bob said those standing stalks become your best friend later on they just do there's no reason to i had an old farmer that had no-till for a while took out his irrigation that was getting older and he told me because we were chopping stalks he said that's the biggest waste of time you're going to spend and it took me 20 years to figure out he was right Are you guys using original equipment, uh, chaff spreaders and residue spreaders, or do you think you need to upgrade that and maybe talk a little bit about 
you know, what you need to, how you need to leave that field after harvest in order to have effective planting in the spring. What Hans said earlier, I, I think the, the first few years you do it, you will face all those challenges. And something happens after about so many years, you don't even think about it that or it, it's not really an issue I mean it just doesn't seem to bother it, 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 I, I don't even think about that I guess how big of a headers do you guys use how wide are your headers six six rows well, no, I mean, no. yeah I, I eight row and then uh, the soybean heads 25 is yours 20 yeah. so yeah if you had bigger heads you might have a bigger issue because I, I know if our spreader doesn't work and then you get it you get the soybeans really thick in an area you know you'll have some stand problems um yeah we did as far as our planning I, you know like you said all our planning equipment is probably different um i have a kinsey i took the no-till colders off and i just have a row clear in the front and um, it's really slick he, he said they're different i I've got Martin Road Cleaners with the air pressure, the precision, and then since I don't use starter fertilizer, I took that bar that's up in front and I put a, a wavy coulter spring-loaded on that that runs right on the row so it just cuts any, any fodder that's crossways into and then the row cleaner sweeps it out of the way. The more even your residue is spread, the better off your situation's going to be for coming in the following spring. You know, as, as harvesting equipment gets bigger, you certainly don't want that residue concentrated in half or two-thirds of the, of the pass where it's coming out the back end of the combine. Or otherwise, when you're going in with the, to plant the following spring, and the more precise planting equipment gets, you have these by row down pressure sensors that can accommodate for that but if you're in a system where you're equalizing the down pressure on all the, the full width of what you're planting you can be in a situation where you're planting an inch inch and a half deeper on part of the pass compared to where all that residue is so you want it spread out as even as possible it's interesting the europeans have different spreaders on their machine built in the u.s shipped over there and that we don't have. They have uh, equipment with vanes that can even adjust for uh, wind direction when you're, when you're uh, harvesting so your residue gets spread better out there. We have to be willing to spend the money on it, I guess, and the Europeans do. But of course, they have fields that are about yay big, so it's a little different than we're dealing with. But uh, it's interesting. So that stuff is available. If you, if you ask for better residue spreading equipment, they make it. They make it in Des Moines, and they ship it to Europe. So. Uh, question of, yes, sir. Yeah, where is your uh, uh, fertilizer program for your corn? Questions about my fertilizer program in corn? With the hog manure? We, oh, okay, got the hog well, manure. I've got the hog manure, so we apply the hog manure and we just split the farm up. We do every acre every year. And we will generally do uh, soybean acres that are going to be soybean acres the following year. We'll do those in the fall in our corn acres will do the manure and, and then we so we just use the manure and uh, um, some nitrogen and that's 28%. it mm -hmm, just 28 percent i don't understand I, I don't understand it, the uh, whole starter thing i don't get because no matter what you do your corn's not going to look as good starting out as the tilled corn it just isn't but if the soil sample says the phosphorus is there uh, um, i mean we'd like top out the yield contest just like hans says i mean it's like they, they laugh at you all summer and then when they find out your real not your uh, way check thing with the little cart but your scale tickets it it just were if the phosphorus is there it's there they found adding phosphorus in a starter doesn't necessarily get your yield up. Your corn may be a little drier at harvest time. Some years that's important, some years who cares. Yeah, I've always struggled over that because we don't use starter either and I feel guilty and then it's, <laughs> you know, 
Never. <laughs> but MSU says, MSU says, no yield has been proven, but use it. So I never figured that one out, but, you know. But um, we we put hog manure on about a third of our corn acreage, you know. So I don't cover every acre, you know, just some of that, and then uh, some of it we do plow in because um, um, we. Just about three years ago, we started a pasture-based dairy, and my nephews are doing that, and we have those cows on the, a lot of the corn stalks, and they just tear it up. And so we have to till so you can physically drive on the field. It's so rough. But have you ever tried to put uh, cover crops in the standing corn before you put the cows in there? Uh, yeah, we have. We flew some on, yeah. and it didn't look like it did anything, but now that I watched your slide, it probably did. You know. It seems to help with the compaction issue with cows. Okay, yeah, because yeah, it, it just wouldn't come up. Um, but yeah, it's, it, otherwise we put just put the lime on top, put the um, potash on top. Everybody says, don't you have to incorporate it? But we haven't, and we've had success. But you have stratification. So yeah, I guess we can measure it. Yeah. Does that do something to your yields? We don't know. We don't think so. I'm, I'm back to using starter fertilizer, and, and I had an experience where I had some fields in corn that I was afraid I was lo losing some bushels, and so I thought, you know, having that phosphorus available, hopefully it helps, and, and, and maybe that's just something for my peace of mind or indigestion when you're looking at those crops. I don't know that it makes a big, big difference, uh, phosphorus levels for the most point, most part in the soil tests are solid, but put a little bit on there for an insurance policy. So I, I, I did some experimenting and, and uh, the visually gave me some concern. You sit there and you listen to the Michigan State requirements and they say you don't need to do it at times, but we still recommend it. You know, that, that no yield boost proven, but but we still recommend having a little phosphorus there at the side of the road. Uh, so so I'm, I'm currently doing it, and, and I don't know if that's just insurance policy or peace of mind. We have a whole program running in Indiana. It's called the On-Farm Network, where we really encourage farmers with any new practice to strengthen on their farm. A lot of guys are doing it already, but with the GPS we have on our combines and our tractors, you can now, and the yield monitors, you can now collect data easier than we did in research trials with drops of grad students, tape flapping in the wind, flags. You don't even have to come out of gear anymore to do that. So it's fairly easy to lay out some trials with your, and I assume you did that, with your starter fertilizer. One strip with, one strip without. Make the strips wide enough, you can at least get one combine pass to there. And actually, you do visual observations, but also at harvest time, and you do this a couple of years, what did I spend on it? What did it do for my yields? And did it buy me landlord buy-in, or did it actually get me bushels in the bin? So there's just several ways to measure that, but try to strip stuff. And uh, do it on the back 40 if you want to, if you're trying some risky stuff, but strip it. And now with the yield monitors, do it at least a combine width so you can measure what you did. Otherwise, you won't know the difference. And it might look better, but you don't know whether, if you do a whole field, you won't know what the, what the treatment did. Just regarding that idea, that idea of doing strip comparisons. Uh, last last two years, we've done nitrogen strip comparisons, and Dan Reiser's come out and marked the field and mount a side dress. And we've done four different levels of total nitrogen application, and uh, again, you get a chance over 10 acres, four different replicated strips to do some comparisons. Sometimes there's a significant yield difference through what comes off the combine monitor other times you're shocked that how few bushels that extra 100 or 150 pounds of nitrogen got you and, and other times you sit there and you say yeah you get the appropriate boost but but there are times where where the test results don't necessarily say more is economically better They claim, you know, that 99% uh, of every soybean uh, 
field planted in corn and it's planted as coated with uh, neonicotinoid pesticide now that goes in the ground and systemically comes up. And then during planting, then there's a, a dust from the talcum or whatever the thing to keep the seed separate is from the planter. And if that drifts onto, say, an aviary and gets into the a beehive and go and buy some eggs that have bees that are just wipe out those hives. Is there more of that dust in no-till or less of that dust that gets generated during the planting um, compared to tillage? Is it something you guys are aware of? Is it is it a real concern? Is it did anybody get a question? I'm not an expert in that at all. You guys? I really don't know. I don't, I don't know, know how big the change impact. of the neonicotinoids is the chlorine. How much, how much do you use of that? I didn't know we used it. It's, it's <laughs> on every, I mean, the way they talk, it's on every commercial seed, and it's, and it's coming up through the... I think it goes by the trade name Gaucho, if that helps you. Yeah, you yeah. I, I just was going to make a comment. We do use that, and, and Hans was at our place on... September 18th and saw how many bees and butterflies and things were around. Um, so, I mean, w is it affecting it? I mean, we're not seeing it. I mean, Hans can tell you how many beneficial insects were there. I think part of the problem is the loss of pollinators and other things. And the reason we went to a 13-way mix of cover crop was to help track some of those things. And, and once we did that, th there's a lot there. We, we just didn't have that beneficial cover crop before to see them. Well, it's kind of two issues. One is during the planting, it's just drip. And then the other one is that bees do visit corn and get pollen off the corn. And that's a little less uh, conclusive in terms of whether or not bees are harmed by that. If they bring it back, um, beekeepers have told me, you know, swap out your combs every three years. You know, down this pesticide will build up inside the combs. Um, have they ever measured that? Oh, absolutely, yeah. But, um, you know, then there's studies out by Bayer who manufactures the stuff, and the oh, no, no, it doesn't harm any bees, and, and then other university studies um, that say, oh, no, no, absolutely it does. But I was just wondering, in terms of the practice, is that something that, you know, we can encourage farmers if, if the no-till has less of that. Obviously, with the cover crops, that's better for the pollinators. Um, but Another thing in terms of that magazine, the editor of that magazine is like, you know, in the old days, you drive through the country and you get done with your drive, you got to stop and you got to clear off your windshield because it's covered with bugs. And you just don't get those bugs anymore. You go for that drive out to the country. Um, you drive different country here. No, I, <laughs> I, I, I got to agree with that. I mean, you, you, drive, you used to have 30 years ago, you'd stop, and you have to go to a gas station. Scrape those bugs off basically with a little ice cream roll magic. And it's not like that anymore. But his, his um, premise is that you know, if there's fewer bugs out there in general because of our agricultural practices, that, that's a, a local on the bees as well. So I, I'm just curious. I, I'm not sure as far as whether no till or conventional. I do know that have grown no till corn and soybeans adjacent to watermelon fields adjacent to orchards where, you know, and this is not always even across the road, sometimes it's just, you know, it's, it's right there. And you're wanting to be very careful with what products you put down so that there's not an aerial drift or things like that or a potential for vaporization. But I, I, have, I haven't ever had that be an issue by the grower that, that have that crop where they were putting the, the hives out adjacent to me. Oh, I, I was just going to say that uh, a lot of people think that we as no-tillers just use a tremendous amount of chemicals. We haven't used insecticides for 15 years. Um, our chemical use is half of what it used to be. And I think the, the the shaded, the cover crops, the whole that management it, it re relieves some of that. Now I can't address that at all, but it, it, our overall chemical use 
is way down. The one, the one place right here is the, the seed that we get now has a lot of that already there where it didn't use to. Well, they, yes, you're, you're, that's right. But I, I don't. But, but even I don't we don't see have dust to, coming off of that out no. of the planters or out of the ground or anything like that. And, and, and we don't have the uh, uh, the weed pressures that we used to. Not because there's something built into the seed or new chemicals. The whole system retards the, the growth of the, of the weeds. Somebody had a remark on that on the beat. I've just a couple of remarks. Uh, uh, as a vegetable grower, I like to go see you know, maybe it's a lot. Uh, um, but in Europe, uh, that chemical has been banned now for two years. There's a, a, a moratorium uh, because of these. Not that it's been proven. I, I, that's important to say. That's the problem. There's a, there's kind of a relationship with the increase of the use of the chemical and the bee die off in this country too. But they can't show it definitively. But um, that came over because I was talking some of those companies. Um, uh, there's there's a ban on the you know for two years, and then they're going to monitor the bee populations and see if there's a change. Just a comment. I'll just tell you that certain insects we have a terrific problem controlling. One is Colorado potato beetle. Um, potatoes, and uh, there's a lot of resistance to regular chemical pump. And uh, this was the first year we used some of the beetles, you know, and it was a real pleasure. <laughs> uh, so. Well, that's the thing is, you know, people, people are that they well. Thank you for the question. I think it's very important that we have to be very conscious in this area because of how many different cropping systems we do have here. So I think the growers are pretty conscious with that type of thing. And that's definitely a new study on beekeeper. I'm definitely into that. But we only have like less than five minutes left. Um, we have these guys up. Is there any more last questions, George? Do you have one question? Yeah. About yeah. About what, what seed uh, the seed companies say we're not using them. Tell me, I'm not using nearly enough. Of course. Um, and I still can't buy their philosophy. And I've tried a little bit of the higher populations. They tell me, well, you're no-tilling, so. Right from the start, you're losing 10 to 20 percent. When we come out and do uh, stand counts, we typically are right at what we planted or a little higher. And I think that's because we don't have any slippage, any wheel slip, because we have a wheel drive. Um, so the highest I've ever planted, and that was this year, was 30,000. I typically plant. 25, 27 in there, and that's even on irrigated ground. But um, with the no-till, we put in some irrigation, and we did that six years ago. Um, I can't, I, I, I can't find the, the big boost I was supposed to get in the irrigation, and I, I think that's part of it. Oh, be uh, beans population. Uh, we put them in 30-inch rows, 140,000. Sometimes we think that's too thick. I don't, no slippage. I never, because I'm always higher than what the book says. I always thought, well, the book's off. Um, we, we, we've been planning a little higher. I guess I'm buying into the seed company uh, rhetoric, so maybe I should, I don't know. Uh, we're about 33. I, I have a little better ground than Ray's. It's like real black, nice prairie. Um, we plant with a grain drill on the beans, 180. I'm not as accurate with the grain drill, but any um, on corn anywhere from twenty-five thousand on the lighter soil up to thirty, or or maybe a little bit more if it's on a piece of ground that I think I can push a push a yield. Uh, we're putting soybeans in fifteen-inch planter. 
got the population between 140 to 155 and I've had a couple other growers that have said they've been doing some studies where they've brought that soybean population down and had some yield boost. So um, when I was planting with a drill, and this was a ways back, felt that I had to push to get 200,000. Uh, certainly found that with 15 inch that I could back that off and save some money now on seed and still have real good stand. Let's see whether the seed companies are right. I was at a couple lectures by different seed companies this year, and they're all telling us that the corn is going to be, in the next 10, 15 years, corn is going to be four feet tall at nose, and we're going to be planting at 48,000 seeds per acre. And we're going to get 400 bushels of corn off of that. Let's what, see whether that's, what's true. What yield, or what, what row spacing? What row spacing are they talking about? Oh yeah, you have to, it's basically what you have to go much narrower because if you, you go about 12 inch row spacing at that point and you have a, a corn <coughs> kernel every foot apart in every which direction and that's the maximum corn, acre, corn kernels you can get in the field. Now they are also working on uh, 60 and 75,000 per acre. I don't know what that looks like or how they get it in. Uh, but just trying all sorts of stuff. Of course, it sells more seed, but if it also makes you more corn, I don't know. I'm just curious what, what actually is going to happen. Because I was cleaning out my office a couple of weeks ago, found a whole bunch of predictions of what was going to happen in ag, and sorry, none of that happened. But uh, I'm curious whether this one is going to happen. Um, on your website, does it have like your speaking calendar throughout the winter? Yeah, we have an event calendar, and it, I think it says who is speaking, because I'm not the only one in Indiana who is speaking on the CCSI. We have a whole group of people helping us out. Our farmers are very active doing presentations, and uh, yeah, you should be able to find it on the website. Give me an email. I can let you know, too. Any other questions for these guys? Um, are you guys sticking around for lunch at all? Well, you may well, you made him work this hard. Sure. I know. <laughs> That's the only reason I came for the work. <laughs> um, I think that's what we're going to do now. I hope everyone's hungry and thirsty. Um, we're going to have to take a break.